Uh, the final talk in the session is from Professor Sunil Swanberg, who will be known to many in this room. He has had and continues to have a distinguished career in Europe and more recently in, in China. Uh, he's here in particular to, to speak uh, on the topic, uh, given his former role as chair of the Nobel Committee uh, for Physics. So I'll pass the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Light and Nobel, the fascination of science. Light is fascinating. And uh, most people think that the Nobel Prizes are also fascinating. Science in general is fascinating. It's a privilege for me to share some of my experience related to these aspects. In October every year, there are some interesting messages from Stockholm on the new Nobel Prizes. And that was the case also last year. It was all about light. But we have seen that before, actually. Quite a number of the Nobel Prizes in physics have been awarded for the general area of the light, lasers, and spectroscopy. And uh, we can see here many of the pictures shown already during these two days. In particular, we can uh, recognize, we can recognize uh, some of the prominent speakers as Steve Chu, uh, Bill Phillips, Professor uh, Alfero, and uh, Serge Haroche here. And um, also in um, chemistry, of course, Professor Sievel is a very good example of uh, uh, an awardee within the field of um, chemistry related to light, and many others, also in medicine. Light can achieve fantastic things. And we saw that amply during these two days here. This is just one example where actually quite a few Nobel laureates have been involved uh, for achieving this. Uh, the possibility to push the limits in precision measuring optical transitions down to 18 digits giving the wavelength of the light to 18 digits precision. That's really amazing. That will allow us to really put challenging questions. Are the fundamental constants really constant? Is our normal world and the anti-world, are they identical or different? Very deep questions that many people found extremely interesting. Alfred Nobel, he was a distinguished inventor. He had 350 patents, but his best invention by far was the Nobel Prize itself. And this is an excerpt of his will that was signed here in Paris, actually. Uh, in uh, 1895, and in good Swedish, it's also written here, physics, yes, physics is one of the prizes which are given out and distributed. How is this procedure done? Well, it comes from nominations from different universities circulated around the world, from uh, uh, prominent scientists, previous Nobel laureates, different organizations in a very transparent way, actually. And there is an evaluation performed through the Nobel committees about the price worthiness. There is a ranking done, very heavy work during the summer months, actually, for committee members. And we make a yearly statement where we review all fields of physics if we stick 
to that particular field. The committee makes its selection, sign the documents in August every year. It's presented to the Royal Academy of Science Physics clause, actually on two occasions, and discussed. And then comes the recommendation to the Academy at large, and the final voting and selection, uh, with the press conference following, uh, is performed. Uh, this present year, it will be on the 6th of October, actually, and it's possible to follow this live uh, on webcast every year. And the ceremony comes on the 10th of December, the day of the death of Nobel. How to get a Nobel Prize? Interesting question, in particular for young people. Well, it's a question of for the physics case about a discovery or an invention. It's definitely not a lifetime accomplishment. Uh, this is very different to most other major prizes, actually. It must be a door opener. It must have lasting impact. And it must have some actuality. And how to achieve this? How to get the prize? Well, the best recipe is probably to encourage free research driven by curiosity, where really it's seamless from very basic science into applied science and so on. That was emphasized so before, because basic science is a question of time, most frequently, when it bears also the practical fruits. A lot of the work is done by the Nobel Committee, and this is just one example. It's the 2005 version of the Physics Committee. Actually, it's not possible to cash a nice check or quite some money unless you have a Nobel lecture. That's in the statutes of the Nobel Prize, actually, and that's always done at the Aula Magna up in Stockholm. Um, this is in 2004, and here it's uh, dealing with asymptotic freedom in uh, strong interactions, actually. There is a nice uh, Nobel reception at uh, the Nordic Museum in Stockholm. It's a reception very similar to the one we had last night, actually, uh, right in this direction, uh, where people meet and mingle. The great day comes December 10. On this particular occasion, it was the 100-year jubilee of the Nobel Prize. The first one was given to uh, Röntgen in 2001, as you might recall. And on this occasion, Actually, all Nobel laureates were invited, so they are sitting there. Uh, this is the year of the Bose-Einstein condensation, so the physicists are sitting over there, actually, the royalties, of course. And um, then comes the moment of truth in the career of a scientist, to be asked to step forward, to receive the prize from the hands of His Majesty the King. We are very happy in Sweden to have the opportunity and possibility to distribute uh, these prizes, actually, which have a very high esteem, probably the most uh, esteemed one in uh, the field of science. And celebrations, clearly, uh, in the town hall of Stockholm. The tradition is that uh, the oldest physics uh, laureate is uh, sitting with the Queen, Sylvia of Sweden. The fascination of science. We try to keep that alive through the Nobel work and through the Nobel Prizes. It can have a great impact to young people we feel as a stimulus, an impetus for really go for it. It covers so many areas. Basically everything we know about the universe is from light, as illustrated here. In the microcosmos alike, 
It comes from light. The foundations of quantum mechanics we heard a lot about. Actually, even before that, Rydberg, working at my university, Lund, he saw the first signs, actually, that there must be some regularity, some quantum mechanics to be, when he saw that it was possible to generate the sharp spectral lines of atoms by a formula. You could crank the formula. There was a magic constant, the Rydberg constant in there, and it produced not just a random telephone number book, but some systematics that was quantum mechanics to come. And from there on, we see all this development we heard about here. Fascinating indeed. Looking into the plasmas of the stars, looking into the spectra of atoms to understand the macrocosmos and microcosmos. We can also use the light for many different purposes. And since I mentioned Lund, I'll just show some areas where we were quite active also at our university. For instance, within the area of uh, studying combustion, even if photovoltaics and all these things are coming so strongly along, of course, conventional combustion is very important. And to make that efficient, and free of pollutants is extremely important. And by laser spectroscopy, it has become possible to really make a difference. Lasers, amply revolutionizing science, all areas, and also our daily life. Environment, environment, environmental pollution is a big threat to most parts of the world, for sure in certain areas like fast developing areas like China. This is just an illustration how it's possible to monitor uh, the pollutant mercury by scanning through the atmosphere by laser radar. It's like magic. You put on your magic glasses and you can see the world in mercury only and see where it's distributed. Pollution is a threat to the world, certainly. There are many other threats also. Uh, I show the area of ecology here. What are problematic there? Well, a problematic thing is that we are on the merge of extinguishing the pollinators by pesticides. If we don't have these flying around, it's a catastrophe, nothing to eat, basically. And you have the disease vectors causing malaria and so on. Laser techniques are very powerful in monitoring the behavior of these creatures and to understand more what they are doing, as illustrated here, where over a field two kilometers, we actually see every individual blip here is a small insect flying into the laser beam. And you can find out a lot about these things in a multidisciplinary approach together with ecologists. The field of medicine, as illustrated by Brian Wilson, and shown as two examples from Lund here, where it's again possible to put on the magic glasses and basically see only the areas which fulfill the cancer criterion in real time, or to treat tumors by photodynamic therapy, by cold photochemistry. Another very important area in medicine is the development of resistance to antibiotics. It's a ticking bomb. We discussed about global warming. We discussed about pollution. We discussed about killing of pollinators. This is another one, really. Oversubscription, which deals to, leads to that nothing works anymore. And we are working a lot, actually, on uh, advanced techniques for distinguish, really, infectious diseases which should be treated and which should not be treated with antibiotics, since it's basically not efficient. The developing world. Light as illustrated amply here, can do a lot for the developing countries. And we have tried ourselves on a small scale 
to help develop this together with supporting organizations in terms of multispectral imaging of malaria, environmental monitoring, agricultural monitoring, and so on, with hands-on workshops, realistic technology, where uh, the equipment stays in the poor countries and can be used for advanced research. Just choosing the technologies through LEDs, through cheap uh, amateur astronomic tubes, and so on, to make the realistic setup, the equipment that is second to none, but happens to be cheap. This is being pursued now at our network in Africa and many places, illustrating here from Nairobi. This is the International Institute for Insect Research in Nairobi, actually. And with cheap equipment now in six different countries in Africa, it's possible to send beams along. Send beams along, and here we monitor the water quality in 120 meters distance, probably for the first time in Africa, uh, by fluorescence monitoring normalized on Raman signal, a lot of insect studies, and so on. Light illuminating the world. Light can do a lot of things. A personal remark, myself being brought out in a house without electricity for the first years of my life, have a special heart then for the developing country and what light can do for them. Light, engineering, science has a bright future illustrated amply at our conference here. And what could it be more appropriate than celebrate together in this international forum, the International Year of Light? Thank you.